the next speaker, point it out for me because I'm hungry. Yeah. Food isn't free either. Food isn't free either. Very good. Very good. You know, we've taken a lot of uh, controversy this year by inviting up this next speaker. I don't understand why. When we invite speakers here to the Tea Party Rally, it's because they have something particular that they want to share with all of us that we either agree with or we should be educated by. And this next speaker, Grover Norquist, our keynote speaker. Come on, you can clap loud enough for Grover Norquist. Come on. I can't think of anyone more perfect to speak at a Tea Party rally than Grover Norquist. He is the president of uh, the Americans Tax Reform, a taxpayer advocacy group that he founded in 1985 at President Reagan's request. For the person who just said, I can. Uh, ATR works to limit the size and cost of government and opposes higher taxes at the federal, state, and local levels. ATR organizes the, the Taxpayer Protection Pledge which asks all candidates for federal and state office to commit themselves in writing to the American people and taxpayers to oppose all tax increases. <laughs> Grover Norquist chairs the Washington, D.C.-based Wednesday meeting, a weekly gathering of more than 150 elected officials, political activists, and movement leaders. Grover Norquist serves on the board of directors of the National Rifle Association of America, the American Conservation Union, big clap, that's okay. And the Parents' Rights Organization, Ariana Huffington calls Norquist the dark wizard of the rights anti-tax cult, and I say he should wear it as a badge of honor, Grover Norquist. the American Conservative Union he was introducing. Don't recycle. Remember what trees did to Sonny Bono. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here in Massachusetts, the home of the first Tea Party, the home of Lexington and Concord, my parents. It's also an interesting anniversary sweet. hundred years ago, some idiot decided we should have an income tax in the United States. And so we've lived with that for a hundred years, and we've begun recently to fight back. Of course, it's also 33 years since Barbara Anderson and the Citizens for Limited Taxation and the voters of this state passed Proposition 2 and a half. And Massachusetts gets a bad rap because some of the guys that you elect to annoy the rest of us in the country. But the voters of this state, you can tell they have a certain common sense because they've been there for Prop 2 and a half and defended it. Uh, and we've begun the process and, and, and you've maintained the flat rate tax in this state, not gone to a grad tax or to a progressive tax. Because the first trick of the other team is to divide us into different groups. At the national level, we've got lots of different uh, brackets, right? Why? So they can divide us into different groups so they can mug us one at a time. That's what, what Clinton did. Remember, he said, I'm only going to hit the top 2%. And then Obama promised he's only going to hit the top 2%. Obama was never going to tax anyone who earned less than $250,000 a year. That promise lasted 16 days, one six. 16 days into his presidency, he started taxing tobacco, average uh, tobacco user, $38,000 income. There are about 10 different taxes on middle income people in Obamacare. It's been one after another. The other team promises that they're going to divide us into different groups. Look, if you have a progressive income tax system, and they can divide the United States or Massachusetts. What, five times Massachusetts has gone to the polls and said no to the grad tax, no to the progressive income tax. Because you understand, and Americans and the rest of the country understands, that if you get divided, you can get picked off. This is the Richard Speck theory of tax increases. If they can't take on everyone in 
in the room, they take them out of the room one at a time. You younger people, check with the person standing next to you about who Richard Speck was. Look, people say, what's the Tea Party? The Tea Party is America awakened. What's the Tea Party done? Change the direction of the country in the good, and I think on a permanent basis. Look, what does everybody in the Tea Party want? They want one thing, and there are lots of different people here for a lot of different reasons. That, that what, we, what we want, each one of us sitting around a table at this rally, on the central issue that moves our vote, we want the government to leave us alone. Yeah. Taxpayers want the government to leave their income alone. Property owners, leave my property alone. I serve, on the, I serve on the board of directors, the National Rifle Association. What do we want? Just leave us alone. We don't go knocking on people's doors, insisting, you know, telling them, you know, you should hunt, telling other people what to do. We don't insist that every fourth grade child in public school be taught books entitled Heather Has Two Hunters. We simply, we simply wish to be left alone. Homeschoolers, two million strong across the country. You don't hear them grabbing your shoulder and telling you to homeschool. They want to homeschool. Up to you what you want to do. So around our, all the various communities of faith, people for whom the most important thing in their life is to practice their faith and transmit it to their children, they wish to be left alone. They're not asking for Baptist stamps. They understand. That's why our party can have evangelical pride. Our movement, the, the Tea Party movement can have evangelical Protestants, conservative Catholics, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, Mormons, all in there. Not everybody agrees how everybody gets to heaven. But if I'm going to be allowed to be free so that I can go straight to heaven, that guy on the other side of the table has got to be free to go completely straight to Hades because he completely misunderstands scripture. But around our table, we're not in conflict on vote-moving issues. The guy who wants to make money all day looks across the table at the guy who wants to go to church all day and says, not how I spend my time. They both look over at the guy who wants to fondle his guns all day, and they say, not how we spend our time. But everybody can get together and vote for the same candidates who agree to leave them alone. And maintain out. And you know, there is another team. They get an at bat. They're getting one right now. They got one in DC with the presidency. Okay? The other team sits around the table, trial lawyers, labor union bosses, big city political machines, the two wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare dependency, people who make ninety thousand dollars a year, managing that dependency, making sure none of them get jobs and join our team. Then we've got all the coercive utopians. These are the people who get government grants to tell their moral inferiors, us, how to run our lives. They're the ones who mandate cars too small to put your whole family into. The ones who came up with and mandated toilets that don't flush completely. <laughs> They're the reason on the Sabbath you have to separate the green glass from the brown glass from the white glass for the recycling priests. <laughs> And they have a list of things that you have to do and a list of things that you're not allowed to do that is slightly longer and more tedious than Leviticus. It goes on and on and on. Now, the other team can get together and jump us if we're stupid enough to keep throwing money into the center of their table. Because when we let them raise taxes, and more money goes into the center of the takings coalition table. What happens? They can all get along. How? Like the scene in the movie after the bank robbery. One for you, one for you, one for you. Everybody on our friends from the status takings coalition, they can smile at each other. But when we do our job right, when we say no new taxes and mean it and hold that line, 
and the money in the center of the left table begins to dwindle. Then they begin to look at each other a little bit more like the second to the last scene in those lifeboat movies. Now they're wondering who they throw overboard or who they eat. Guys, look, the other team isn't stupid, they're evil. Never make the mistake of assuming they're stupid. It seems stupid only if you think they're trying to do what you're trying to do. They're not trying to do what you're trying to do. They're trying to take your stuff, among other things. And starting with freedom. Now, trick number one, divide us into different groups, mug us one at a time. Trick number two, trickle down taxation. When they sold us, us, I'm not sure anybody here is old enough to have been fooled this time. When they sold us on the income tax, only people, it was between 1 and 7 percent, that was the national federal income tax. Lowest income people, you had to make $98,000 in today's dollars, you paid 1 percent. If you made more than 11, 11 and a half million dollars, you paid 7 percent. Okay, that was the income tax. Over time, more than half of Americans pay the income tax. The bottom rate is 10 percent which is more than people who made $11 million in 1913 were paying as a percentage, and it goes up to almost 40%. Trickle down taxation. Promise you're gonna tax the rich, go after everybody. Remember the alternative minimum tax? Put in to, to hit 155 people. 155. 155 people weren't paying their fair share. 1969, our friend Ted Kennedy had a great idea. So I'm gonna tie code, structured to get 155 people, today it hits 3, 4 million, trickle down taxation. Some of us remember the Spanish-American War. Spanish-American War was in 1918-98, was going to be paid for with taxes on rich people. How do you tax rich people in 1898? You tax them on this newfangled thing called the telephone. And they put the federal excise tax on the phone, which you may have noticed over the years on the bottom of your little phone thing, little F-E-T. Okay, now, I went to public school, but I was watching the History Channel the other day, and I came to realize that the Spanish-American War has been over for some time. But the whole country, rich, poor, middle class, was paying the rich person's tax only for a war that was temporary and we paid the tax for more than 100 years. The other team will always play trickle-down taxation with us and that's what we've got to stop. Now in Washington, D.C., we've got gridlock, which is better than what we had for the first two years of the Obama administration, was moving as fast towards statism and higher taxes and more government control as you could get. But beware of people who suggest the good old days of bipartisan compromise. Remember what they were. Richard Nixon wanted the government to get bigger. Teddy Kennedy wanted it to get much bigger. And they'd get in a room, and they would compromise. And every year, the government would get much bigger. In between very much bigger and simply bigger, okay? And year after year after year, the compromise was compromising our liberty. I am all in favor of compromise on the road to liberty. Getting freer and less burdened, more slowly than I'd like. Okay, as long as we're moving as fast as we can in the right direction. If we're trying to go from here to California, getting as far as Missouri is not treason. Missouri is on the way to California. But if our feet are wet and the people around us are speaking French, we're losing. We're going in the wrong direction. Now, while we have a fight in Washington that matters because one group wants to go bigger government, lower ta higher taxes, more spending, one wants lower taxes, less spending, and let me say that that is the change that the Tea Party made. I'm amazed when establishment press guys say, so where's the Tea Party, what's it doing, what is it accomplished? Before the Tea Party, before 2009, it's only been four years, the modern Republican Party had learned one thing, don't raise taxes. 
Not bad. Good start. Not the whole 